Good evening. I am Anu Natarajan, a Sierra Club member, an urban planner focused on housing and sustainability, and your moderator for this evening. This evening is brought to you by the San Francisco Bay Chapter of the Sierra Club, Livermore Indivisible, 350 East Bay, Castro Valley Citizens Climate Lobby, the Peace and Justice Action Team of the Star Unitarian Universalist Church, and the communities of the new Assembly District 20. The purpose of this meeting is to provide a forum that focuses on environmental justice and creates a, an opportunity for community members to ask their questions of the candidates. Tonight, we are offering English Spanish language interpretation. I'm sorry, English Spanish language translation. To access the Spanish channel, click the globe icon at the bottom of your screen that reads interpretation and then click Spanish. So this is the format for tonight. All the candidates have received the questions ahead of time, except for any questions you may pose during the discussion. We will go over our shared agreements, open with candidate introductions and statements, and then members of the community will post their questions. We will wrap up the evening with the candidates' two minute closing statements. I also wanna encourage all the attendees to post your questions on Q&A. While we may not be able to get to all the questions, we will make sure to pass those on to the candidates. And before we begin, I would like to introduce you to Kathy Durbin from 350 East Bay to help set the context for tonight's conversation and explain why we as communities should care about what happens in Sacramento. Kathy? Thanks, Anu. 350 East Bay is a regional climate advocacy group, part of the 350 Bay Area Network. There I've coordinated our state legislative um, policy work on climate for the last eight years, which has involved working with our Bay Area legislators, both in districts like here in Assembly District 20, in Sacramento, and with hundreds of advocacy groups that work for a healthy, more just, and safe environment and climate for our state and future generations. I can tell you from firsthand experience, we need more climate justice champions in Sacramento. Climate is not just an environmental issue. Climate is the human rights, health, justice, economic, jobs, and protecting the future issue. It is urgent. It touches everything. And we need representatives who can bring people together to meet the challenge of our lifetime. We need to implement solutions, transition off of fossil fuels, and ensure a role for all in the green economy of California. Our country is experiencing a traumatic crisis around democracy and voting rights at this very moment. Your being here tonight as constituents, voters, youth, and as candidates is a testament to defending that democracy. Anu? Kathy, thank you. Um, I'm now gonna take a few minutes to reiterate our shared agreements for the evening. These agreements are from the Peace and Justice Action Team of the Star Unitarian Universalist Church. How we conduct ourselves is even more important than what we say. As such, we're asking the candidates to join us in committing to the following shared agreements for this event. One, respect each other's speaking time and perspectives. Two, focus on the issue, not the person. Three, listen to each other. Four, seek to understand differing perspectives and be curious as to what you can learn. Five, be accountable for the impacts of your words and actions. Six, no personal attacks or disparaging each other. Out of fairness and respect to each other and our community, we will be muting those comments if they occur. This is a community-driven space that respects each of us and our lived experiences. Candidates, do we have your commitment to these shared agreements? Just a thumbs up would be great. Thank you. 
Let me now introduce the candidates in alphabetical order. Jennifer Esteem, do you wanna wave? Joe Gercher, Sean Kumagai, Liz Ortega Toro. Please join me in welcoming our candidates and thank them for taking the time to join us this evening. So we will now start with opening statements. Each candidate has two minutes. We'll start with Jennifer, then move to Joe, Sean, followed by Liz. And we'll change the order for each of the questions subsequently. Um, so Joe, I'm sorry, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Anu, and thank you, Sierra Club, 350 Star Unitarian, 350 Star Unitarian, other co-sponsors, and every audience member. This is a critically important conversation we're going to have tonight. My name is Jennifer Steen. I am a nurse, healthcare and climate justice warrior, and I know that environmental justice is healthcare justice. The two are so deeply connected and we need leadership because we have to have transformation. The urgency of this moment is clear as we heard a moment ago. I have been inspired by young people and activists. When my son was 15 years old, he put coal dust on his face and laid on the ground with other activists, other teenagers and members of coalition groups to stop coal from coming into Oakland. That was five years ago. And I am so grateful to the work he did then and the work of community members who might even be watching tonight. California is the fifth largest economy in the world. The time is now for us to lead. There are questions though, how do we lead? Do we invest in more mass transit? Do we invest in dense green housing? And do we keep fossil fuel in the ground? Do we support a California climate jobs plan also known as the California Green New Deal? The answer is yes to all of the above because if we don't, who will? Everyone knows that California leads the way. There's a reason that I have the trust and the endorsement of SEIU California, which is the largest group of unionized working people in this state. It's because I'm a registered nurse and I'm an organizer. And the very first time that I started organizing and fighting, I saved my clients from losing their housing and being evicted. I work every single day to support our Alameda Health System as a trustee and support ending health disparities like through programs like the Black Birth Initiative. Thank you all so much. Joe. Hi, uh, my name is Joseph Gercher and uh, it's easy to remember because you, you cannot spell it and you probably can't pronounce it without help. So I've lived in the Eden area for most of my life. I came here from the University of Illinois where I got a doctorate in mathematics, uh, like the current uh, assemblyman. And then I went to work at the government laboratories in Livermore and Berkeley for 30 years. And uh, you can uh, find the papers that I wrote in many scientific journals and now I'm retired. So I wanna focus on two main issues that I would work on if I'm elected to be your assemblyman. The first is parks. The parks that we have, this is a critical part of the quality of life and it's largely a government function. The parks we have are pretty much uh, what we had 50 years ago in the same place. They're all mostly on the Oakland side of the district. Yet every 10 years, Alameda County adds 150,000 people that's a city the size of Hayward, and those people all live in the southern part of the county. So it's clear that we need uh, more parks. The East Bay Park District and the municipal parks are all great, but I think they need some help from the state. I'd like to see the entire shoreline of the East Bay turned into a state park. At the only time we own, at the present time, the only state park we have is up in Oakland, 
it's an urban park and from my observations it's not uh it's little used the second thing that i want to focus on is our location in the bay area everyone knows that we're in the exact center of the bay hayward says we're the heart of the bay area and what that means is that our freeways which we've built and invited people to use are constantly crowded so i want to propose building a tunnel to take traffic from west dublin to the san mateo bridge underground and take traffic off of our freeways so that our quality of life will be improved here thank you thank you joe um sean good evening i'm dublin council member sean kumagai thank you anu for moderating this forum and i want to thank the amazing organizers for all your work in putting this forum together it's community organizers like you that help to inform our communities and our elected officials so thank you for engaging in this race I'm a third generation veteran, son of a first generation Japanese immigrant, and the first openly LGBTQ elected official to serve in the Tri Valley region. I'm a trained instructional designer and workforce development professional. I've served over 20 years as an intelligence professional in the US Navy, and I currently work as the district director for Assembly Member Bauer Cahan. I got my start in politics and policy alongside many of you, and it is what led me to running for local elected office, and it has informed my work on city council. And in my time on city council, we have been able to create nearly a thousand middle income housing units in Dublin and initiate three different transit oriented affordable housing projects. We set a bold climate action plan that put us ahead of our greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. We took on big tobacco by banning all flavored tobacco products, including vape. And we put in place one of the most progressive safe gun storage ordinances in the state. And now I'm running for assembly to serve the people of Assembly District 20. It's a serious responsibility and I decided to run because I believe I'm the person who is best equipped to do the most good for the most people of this district. I come ready loaded to get to work for the people of this district on day one. And I'll bring decades of experience working within the federal, state, and local government to get results for the East Bay. I look forward to tonight's discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Liz. Buenas noches, environmental champions. Thanks for being here tonight, especially to Marta. Thank you for all your great work at getting us here. My name is Liz Ortega, and I'm ready to deliver as your next assembly district representative for District 20. For over two decades, 20 decades, sorry, for over 20 decades, uh, for over 20 years, I apologize, for over 20 years and most of my life, I have worked tirelessly to improve the lives of everyone in my community and I've delivered. I've grown up in the East Bay as an undocumented child that came to this district at the age of three. I know firsthand that the people of color who look like me are the most impoverished communities and are directly impacted by climate change. I'm a vocal and unapologetic leader who fights for environmental justice and against greedy corporations. I will fight to protect California, coastlines and wildlife, support clean energy investments and push for stricter environmental regulations to protect our planet and for future generations. At the same time, I want us to challenge ourselves and think critically about the green jobs that we envision and talk about. Recycling was the first environmental program that became a mass cultural program that we all felt good about as we recycled our cans and our bottles. Now looking back, how many of us really thought about the impact of the mountains of cans, bottles, and bacteria carrying materials that sit in our wastelands? or about the thousands of people of color who work here and work for minimum wage and have to sort through all of those materials. I am Liz Ortega and I'm running to for state assembly representative because I delivered and will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you candidates. Um, for our first question, let me introduce Helena Strader, a community leader from Castro Valley. Helena?
Do we have Helena? We do have Helena. Let me see if I can unmute Helena. Helena, I'm going to try and put you, you are unmuted. Can you hear me now? Thank I you. Can. Yes. Oh, this modern technology gets me all the time. <laughs> um, my name is Helena Strauder. Good evening. And Martha, I want to thank you for inviting me to be one of the uh, the panelists with a question. I am a member of the Castro Valley Democratic Club. Um, since 2009 to 2014, I was elected as assembly district in 25 and district um, 18. I also wrote several resolutions based on the issue of the economy, which was voted on and adopted by the California Democratic Party. And one was when the um, our community was hit so hard with predatory lenders and foreclosures. That was my biggest piece that I spent a lot of time on. My question is to the candidates, we are in climate energy and Governor Newsom has proposed several important steps to move California away from oil extraction, but he still is approving oil drilling. Would someone go and pluck him on the head, please? Now, which those things harms our environment, our environmental justice community. It adds to air pollution and further, further damaging our climate. You remember in 2005, um, Al Gore gave a documentary on that. So my question to the panelists is this, how would you work to create a comprehensive plan for economic job transition that will act faster to phase out fossil fuel extraction. Thank you, Helena. For this question, we'll start with Joe and then move to Sean, Liz, and Jennifer. Joe? Hi, thank you for the question. It's a really good one. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little story. Two years ago in March, Alameda County shut down for a whole month, the only factory in the United States that makes electric cars. Now think about that. This is the only factory in the US and at the time in the world that made electric cars and we shut it down. As a result, the Tesla company decided that Alameda County was too risky for business. And since then, all of their new factories have been built outside Alameda County. These factories have lots of good jobs. For example, in Austin, Texas, the Tesla factory there has a standing offer to hire all the high school graduates to work in the new factory. They're investing in local colleges to start programs in robotics so that the students come out with degrees in operating high-tech factories and programming um, modern robots. So we have nothing like this in Alameda County directly as a result of incompetence in the Alameda County government, okay? In fact, the whole Bay Area became rich from high-tech companies, yes, except okay. Alameda County. San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara, they're all richer than we are. Why? Something is wrong with it. I'm sorry, Joe, I had to stop you briefly because um, we just really don't want you to call government corrupt, sorry. Oh, I was muted, sorry. Or did you unmute me? You, you're, you're good, go ahead. Okay, so did was I muted when I spoke or not? Only for a brief moment there. I just wanted to remind you of the shared agreement not to um, disparage things. Thank you so much. Okay. You have five seconds left. I don't know where I ended, but what we have to do is find out why Alameda County is not a friendly environment for high-tech businesses. That's where you have to start. Thank you. Um, Sean? 
Thank you for this very important question, Helena. Um, we really must take bold and decisive action to move as quickly as possible away from fossil fuel utilization. That's why when I, on Dublin City Council, I've worked to pass a bold climate action plan. Like I said earlier, it puts us, it puts us on track to bring our ground, ground, uh, greenhouse gas emissions down ahead of our 2030 and 2045 reduction goals. And we did this by uh, moving every household in Dublin to 100% renewable energy provided through East Bay Community Energy. And we're gonna convert our fleet of zero, uh, to uh, zero emission vehicles. And we're gonna put in place uh, what's called reach codes to ensure that new construction utilizes uh, the most energy efficient methods. And we're also gonna disincentivize the use of natural gas in new construction. And as your assembly member, I'm gonna continue this work. We're gonna focus on electrification of our buildings and our transportation sector. And I believe we can do this by creating financial incentives. If we're gonna take on these tough challenges, we're going to need to work cooperatively with the private sector, not in, in, um, in uh, adversarially to them. We need to advance technology and innovation. And through that process, we can create good paying green jobs. We've, done, we've got a lot of work to do here um, and we have done some work, but it's not enough. Uh, California's fourth climate assessment estimates that in, by 2050, the economic cost to California for losses from catastrophic wildfires, droughts, floods, and sea level rise is gonna reach $100 billion annually. It's really scary and we're gonna have to really invest more now if we're gonna stop this. Thank you. Um, since we are doing Spanish translation, um, can I ask each of the candidates to speak a little slower, please? I know you have a lot of information to pack into the two minutes, but if you could just slow down your pace a little bit, that will help. Um, thank you. Liz, you're next. Am I still unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. Sound great. Okay. Uh, I support ending fracking period, and I'd be happy to mess up Governor Newsom's hair. Um, change only happens with trust and continuing to work with groups like yours. While building a coalition of environmental leaders, we can create a common purpose. We need to continue supporting and funding alternative renewable, en renewable energy sources and new construction needs to be built with the latest green construction standards. However, we have to look at including all stakeholders. We have a bad history in California of green companies supporting new technology and electrification, but not supporting the workers. Tesla was mentioned earlier. We have them right in our backyard. Unfortunately, the workers who built those Tesla vehicles for our environment can't buy one of them and in fact, often get injured on the job because they're, a, because they're building them. They also have to drive miles into the, the company that they work for because they can't, live to, they can't afford to live in the Bay Area. In order for us to get off fossil fuels, we need to bring those who provide high road careers to the table, along with folks from the green industry. I have done this and I will continue to do this work. I represent a wide range of folks. And recently, we were able to stop Amazon from coming into the city of Hayward because we put health over profits. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jennifer. First and foremost, we need to keep fossil fuel in the ground. This is incredibly complicated because we worry about the people who work in these industries. A comprehensive plan already exists today. We do not need to make one now because it get, the plan guarantees millions of jobs, good union jobs. It's called the California Green New Deal or the California Climate Jobs Plan. And it's centered around equity and justice. It's a plan that is a solution at the scale of the crisis. It values skills that already exist. It prioritizes frontline communities for those millions of jobs and provides a career pathway for everyone in the community. So the solar industry alone right now employs more than 65,000 workers. People like Ken Wells, who was a formerly incarcerated man, and now he owns his own solar business after being trained through the industry. 
Let me give you an example of what we had happen last year, legislatively. The Sierra Club had 49 priority legislative bills. Not one of the most impactful bills was passed, but our governor did actually sign an executive order to give us 3,200 feet setback after an oil spill in Huntington Beach. We can no longer be reactionary when it comes to making policy. We cannot act after disasters. We have to be proactive. There's a Harvard study that was recently published that says people are 15 times more likely to die after prolonged exposure to air pollution. In 8020, we have 580, 880, 680 and 238. We are surrounded by freeways and diesel pollution. That's time, Jen. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, next, we have April Chan, a parent and community leader from Fairview, who will ask the next question. April? Can we unmute April, please? I just did. I'm so sorry. I mean, I did on purpose, so I'm not sorry about that. <laughs> she should be able to speak now. April? Able to un I wasn't able to unmute, sorry about that. Okay, my name is April Chan and I live in unincorporated Fairview. I am honored to serve as a panelist tonight. I serve on the Fairview MAC, Alameda County Fire Citizens Advisory Commission, and I'm also a former aide to Congresswoman Barbara Lee. In the recent past, wildfire was a back of bind issue, but in the last couple of years, it has become the preeminent threat to the community. As a parent who has seen climate change, how, who has seen how climate change has impeded the likelihood of fire, I ask each of you the following question. And I'm, I'm gonna say a lot of numbers, just, to, just as a heads up. With a $46 billion surplus, Governor Newsom recently presented his 2022-2023 state budget with a, $15 billion, with a $15 billion for climate programs. What would your budget priorities be to accelerate the state's climate goals and make sure that disadvantaged communities are fully included? Thank you, April. Um, for this question, we'll start with Sean, Liz, Jennifer, and Joe in that order. Thank you, April, for this very uh, important question and for all your work you do in the community. I always love chatting with a fellow uh, legislative staffer. <laughs> well, I'm, you know, I'm very excited about the, the good work that we're doing with our historic budget surpluses. Uh, but I want to also mention a very exciting bill that's being moved through uh, the assembly this year. It's AB 1001, and it advances environmental justice conversation. What it would do is it would require us to directly mitigate for adverse air or wa water quality impacts in a disadvantaged community when we're developing. It would also require that all public agencies implementing CEQA to give consideration to the principles of environmental justice. And these types of mandates are really great, but as an, a local elected official, there's always an associated cost with that. So what I would like to see is that we make sure that in our budget, when we have these kinds of really bold plans, that we're putting money into in place, especially in these disadvantaged communities where they may not have the, the money to implement these, these plans and we can invest in them in covering the, by covering the associated costs of these policies so they can do that sequel work in a way that doesn't prevent the important development work that they need to do. We've also done recently done amazing things in climate change research and development credit and the um, uh, green energy technology credit. And these programs will incentivize private investment in developing green energy technologies and helping us to mitigate climate change. Over the past two years, we've allocated $10 billion for a multi-year investment to expand zero emission vehicle adoption with a focus on low income consumers. So these are the types of things I'd like to see us continue doing. Thank you, Sean. Liz? 
Yes. So currently, as the head of the Alameda Labor Council, representing 135,000 workers, um, from wearing scrubs to holding a hammer, I was getting the calls during one of our darkest days in history. Uh, I don't know if you remember when we woke up and the sky was orange at 10 a.m. Um, and so I really, you know, I really focus on making sure that the budget that we have and the surplus that we have really does go to these impacted communities. I want to make sure that the worker who's building these electric vehicles is able to buy one himself or herself. I want to be able to work on bills like Senator Lena Gonzalez, who introduced SB 726, a bill that was put on pause uh, because it required stronger coordination on zero emission vehicle funding. And that's what I bring to the table. I bring the ability to negotiate. I do that for a living. I do that every day. It's part of what I wake up thinking about in terms of our communities and making sure we have a planet for our children and our grandchildren. And that's why, again, I fought against uh, big corporations like Amazon trying to come into our communities and to our district to continue polluting our air. I want to work with the governor's office. I want to work with the assembly members and other senators and bring back the fracking bill that just died because the building trains weren't made part of that conversation. I'm the only one that's able to bring those people to the table and make a difference. Thank you, Jennifer. You know, I'm a registered nurse. When I see my community in need, I act. It's why I'm running and it's why I'm here with you all tonight. We have to be proactive. We have to meet the scale of the crisis. Remember Katrina? Remember the tornadoes in the Midwest last month? Fires in Colorado last month? Fires in California year after year being fought with prison labor as a cost-saving measure that our elected officials keep choosing. They want these folks in prison instead of investing in their civil rights and all of our futures. If we're talking about justice, we're talking about justice for all. $15 billion is a great start, but it is not nearly enough. In 2021, the fire season in California is set to cost 45 to $55 billion to recover, just the fire season. We're not even talking about drought. We're already spending this money, but we have to do it as a prevention and not a reaction from the next ca catastrophe. We have to invest in mass transit and infrastructure right now. We have to scale up fast so that we can build infrastructure of the future that is clean, green, and carbon neutral. We have to prioritize workers in disadvantaged communities so that we can train, employ, and house all of us. And my first big win when I fought for legislation was a progressive tax measure to tax excessive CEO income. The voters said yes to this, and they will say yes again. California is home to 189 billionaires with a B. The money to pay for this infrastructure exists today, and we can get it together with healthcare, equity, and justice first and foremost. Thank you, Joe. Um, actually, I'm, I'm kind of in disbelief at this question because California is on track to meet its climate goals. The basic climate goal is to get carbon out of the atmosphere. And the legislature decided that they wanted to cut carbon emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. And Governor Brown did that. We, we met that goal four years early, mainly by closing down uh, polluting uh, power plants. And we built some natural gas plants like the one that Assemblyman Quirk built on the Hayward shoreline. I'm not happy it's there, but it's a clean plant. It's natural gas. So the next goal is to reduce our emissions to 40% of 1990 levels by uh, 2030. And the way that that's going to be done is the state has said that you cannot sell fossil fuel burning cars in this state after 2030 or maybe 2035. So that, that problem is being solved right now. I mean, is anybody here gonna buy a gas guzzling car ever again? You're gonna buy a Tesla or some equivalent car from Volkswagen. So why are we spending money 
talking about solving problems that the state is doing a really good job on and is solving it. Okay, just wait for the policies we've got now to, to come to pass. And as far as that $46 billion budget surplus is concerned, hey, I could use some money. We've got the highest taxes in the state. I want the governor to give me my money back if he's got $46 billion that he's not supposed to spend on anything. Thank you. Thank you. And before we move to the next question, I want to remind our attendees to put in their questions either in the Q&A section or, or chat. And hopefully if we have time at the end, we'd like to get to those. So for the next question, I'd like to invite Justine Tsai, a housing advocate from Union City. Justine. Justine, are you unmuted? Should we come back to Justine? Is she, is she on? Okay. Yeah. All right. Glad it worked. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Justine Tai, a uh, Union City resident, and a um, and a, and I work in affordable housing. Um, I also organize for safe schools in um, in Fremont, and a huge part about safe schools are also um, uh, equitable homes. And um, so current suburban land use patterns and a lack of public transit options have led to longer commutes and increased congestion, which has, has a direct impact on global warming. How will you balance the need for adequate and affordable housing for all and preservation of open land? Thank you, Justine. So for this question, we'll start with Liz, uh, followed by Jennifer, Joe, and then Sean. Thank you. Um, so I talked earlier about representing workers and doing that every single day. I recently um, worked on the Oakland teacher strike. And there I heard stories of teachers either living in their cars or commuting from Tracy to Oakland, that spending hours in their car um, and contributing to our gas emissions. So individual contributions to the climate crisis are heavily driven by the length of our commute and vehicles miles traveled, making equitable housing policies a priority. I will work with many of you in the, and the housing committee chair, Buffy Wicks, to address the issue of homelessness by making sure we invest in affordable housing. It will cost a lot of money, but we need to ensure that we have affordable housing near public transportation that's reliable and that's safe. We need accountability to ensure that our taxpayer dollars are actually going to the communities that we care about. We need housing production at all levels. My priority will be to make sure that our essential workers have the ability to buy a home. Our teachers, our nurses, and our firefighters who are all working to save our lives and the planet need a safe place to live. It shouldn't have to be driving four hours a day to get to their home or to their job. That's why I'm supporting SB9 as well and making sure that we continue growth in our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Dense housing with green spaces in our communities that are the most impacted by climate change is what we need, especially communities of color, which typically have less green space by design because of planning decisions. We need to allow access for the public and preserve wild species that are in these green spaces. You know, it's a sad assumption that green spaces in our communities will not be treated respectfully by the folks who live here. Indigenous people were here before any Western folks showed up and are still the best stewards of our land. We need to have resilience hubs in our communities so that we can bring community members together to create space that is safe for all of us where we can operate in harmony. We do need living wage jobs, absolutely. And we have to shift away from single person electric cars to mass transit. You know, Alex Lee said recently that electric vehicles 
might be the future of cars, but they are not the future of transportation. And he's right, because our transportation has to be scalable quickly. It's not going to happen by digging tunnels under Dublin. It's not going to happen by digging tunnels under the bay or by waiting years for a bullet train or some other rail. Buses exist today. We have zero emission buses, and we just have to make sure that the refueling is coming from clean sources. We can have thousands more buses on the road in just a matter of months and suddenly have the ability to get people back and forth efficiently, safely, and it can be a nice ride. In addition to that, when we build housing that is deeply affordable, mixed income, next to transit hubs, we will solve these issues. Thank you, Jennifer. Next is Joe. So again, I'm just kind of astonished at this question. Uh, the basic, oh, can you hear me? Did I? The basic issue is that there is something bad about driving long distances to go to work because it produces pollution. Okay. By 2030, cars will not pollute, they will be electric. There will be no pollution from cars. So cars will no longer impact global warming. It's fine. You can drive to Sacramento to go to work and it will have no effect on global warming. So we don't have to solve this problem. Um, it's, it, I just don't understand why we're keeping going around circles solving problems that the state legislature and the governor have already laid out a roadmap to solve. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Well, I just want to start off by saying we absolutely have not reached our climate goals and we have a long way to go. And there was an interesting study that was put out by Lawrence Livermore National Labs that um, talked about how we can go uh, net negative in our uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And that's absolutely what we need to be doing because California needs to lead and the rest of the country, the rest of the world is still uh, very behind on this. But getting back to the question at hand around housing, you know, I ran for city council because when I returned back from a deployment and moved to Dublin, I could barely afford to find a place to live. Not only was it exceedingly expensive, but it was uh, every, uh, you know, house that we applied for, every two bedroom house, there were 10 to 20 applicants and we just couldn't find a place. So the housing crisis is real. The lack of inventory is real and it's affecting people in their daily lives. People are, are heavily rent overburdened currently. And that means that they can't pay money on uh, other uh, you know, expendable uh, uh, things. Uh, they can't save for, uh, to buy a home. They can't save for college for, for their families. Um, so what I've done is made it my mission to work on housing policy on city council. And I will continue to do that work as your assembly member. We have to do it in a smart way. We have to do it in an equitable way. We need housing across the uh, affordability spectrum, all the way from deeply affordable housing that is subsidized for very low and low income earners to the uh, uh, middle income housing for our teachers and our essential workers all the way up to your starter homes. What's a starter home anymore? You can't find a starter home in the Bay Area anymore. So you have to uh, really think about how we're gonna build housing along that whole spectrum. And then let's talk about senior housing. I mean, thank seniors need to have, home. thank you. Thank you. Next, we join by co-host um, Jennifer Coney from the Peace and Justice Action Team. And she will be joined by Mireya Reynoso, a student at the Burbank Elementary School, Hayward, who has a question for all of you. Go ahead, Mireya. Good evening. My name is Mireya Josefina Reynoso. I live and go to school in Hayward. I'm in the fifth grade and attend Burbank Elementary. My question is, if elected, how will you make sure that the voices of future generations have a say in building the health of our planet? All right, for this question, um, we'll start with Jennifer, Joe, Sean, and then Liz. 
Thank you for that question. I would say the first thing that I would do and try to do is ask permission of youth so that I can enter their spaces, listen and learn from their wisdom. Youth must be at the table in these discussions as leaders because you all are the ones with the most at stake. You have the most clarity and I will invite you in all the time, every step of the way. I mentioned earlier that it was my 15 year old who was my inspiration around the climate. I plan to follow the lead of our youth because you have no limits to what you know is possible and you are creative in your approach. So I will bring you to the table so that you can speak to me directly and so you can speak to everyone else. I also wanna give much respect to our elders. I think it is folks at every end of the age spectrum that have a lot to offer us and are full humans. Uh, a few months ago, I marched to the state capitol with youth as a part of the Sunrise Movement so that we can keep fossil fuel money out of our Democratic Party. And I am taking no corporate contributions in this campaign. I'm a grassroots candidate that is, and my campaign is truly run by community for community. I'm the only candidate in this campaign that actually addresses climate change on my website, which is kind of shocking because I want to be a good steward of the, for the world and for the benefit of the next seven generations to come. And I hope that we all operate in the same regard. I'm a nurse. I not only believe that healthcare justice is climate justice, I'm doing my best to stand in this truth every single day as a healer of people and a healer of our planet. And I am looking forward to working with our young people to do exactly that. Thank you, Jennifer. Joe? Hi, I, I really appreciate this question, young lady, and I, and I hope that you uh, will continue trying to have a voice in, uh, in social affairs. The short answer is I will not vote for any borrowing of money that will require your generation to pay enormous taxes to pay off the bills that my generation is racking up. The main thing that you need in order to save the planet in the future is to have options. That requires using your own money. And the, what we've been doing, the people of my generation, is we are using your money right now by running huge deficits in Washington and elsewhere. So I will not contribute to that. Thank you, Sean. Matea, what a really great question. And I wanna thank you for engaging in this forum and um, for having a voice in the process. And this is what it's all about, right? I mean, uh, I, you know, in my work with, um, it, as a city council member and working in an assembly office currently, one of the things that I enjoy most are internship programs because it gives me an opportunity to interact directly with the younger people and give them a voice. You know, it's, I, I learn as much from them as they learn from me. And I love having that mutual relationship with young activists, with young um, uh, um, uh, interested minds like, your, like yours, Mireya. You know, so um, that's one of the things that I will continue to do. I believe it's something that I can do to give back to my community and give back to the younger generation. Uh, and, you know, on top of that, uh, I commit as an assembly member to invest more in public education. You know, I think that it, the more money that we can put into programs so that your schools can be the best they can be so that teachers get paid good um, you know, uh, job, you know, get paid good wages, living wages, and so that, that uh, you can have the best facilities in your schools. And, you know, that's, what, that's what's going to make it so that you can grow up and uh, be uh, fully educated to engage in our civic conversation. So that's my commitment to you, Maria. And I really want, again, thank you for being here. Thank you, Sean. Liz? Mireya, you give me hope. Uh, you give me hope for our future and everything that we need to get through this climate crisis and save our world. And thank you so much for being here. I want to make sure that I have youth at the table. I have kids. 
Uh, and trust me, they all have opinions about how we should tackle this crisis. And one of the things they always tell me is, mom, you better not be selling us out. And I guarantee that I will not be selling any of us out. And that's why I've worked so hard to put health over profits and making sure that youth are at the table to tell us about what they want to see in their in their community, what they're feeling in their schools. Um, we just fought against closing schools in Hayward. I, I don't wanna be fighting against closing schools. I wanna be fighting to make sure that you're able to have clean air in your schools. I wanna make sure that you have masks uh, for not just COVID, but when days when we can't go outside because climate is so bad. I wanna hear from you guys about what you think about what we need as future generations are to come. I will also work to appoint kids like you, Mireya, to the environmental youth leaders to have a voice on the newly established California Youth Empowerment Act. The only way we're gonna be able to move forward is to have people like you, Mireya, to have people stand up, to give us hope and to push us to hold us accountable as leaders in our community, which is something that's missing and we need more of. We need more Mireyas in this world. Thank you for being here tonight. Mireya, I wanna echo the comments from all of the candidates. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your question. And I hope you stay engaged. Um, and Jennifer, thank you for bringing Mireya to this forum today. And um, I'm sorry, I didn't give you a chance to ask your question or make a comment. So could you please join us now? Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, Mireya is one of the youth leaders from Stark King Unitarian Universalist Church in Hayward. And uh, we're part of the Peace and Justice Action Team. And we embody the values of over 120 adult and youth members and allies. Um, we believe in the interconnected web of life and that the survival of the Earth's ecosystem is directly linked to our own survival and that harm to any is harm to all. And because of this, we are compelled to take strong action to build the health of our planet and justice in our communities while joining forces with those who have values that reflect our own including the voices of future generations so that they can have a say in the future that will be theirs. In sum, we take action out of the greater love that connects us to build a thriving future for all while working to ensure that no one is left behind and all voices are heard. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you again, Maria. Uh, moving on to our next question, uh, Jason Carney, a community leader from Castro Valley, will ask the question. Jason? Okay. I do not see Jason in the room. I, oh, I'm here. I just don't oh, thank God. have my uh, video working. I wish uh, Maria was here to help me. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. We can hear you. Okay. Um, so thank you, Anu, and thank you, Martha, and the candidates and everyone else who made this debate possible. And thanks for inviting me. I've lived in the Bay Area since 1976. I'm currently uh, the uh, treasurer of the Castro Valley Democratic Club and the club rep to the Central Committee, and I've been a member since 2014. Uh, the last question is a basic yes or no question, and I hope it's a simple one. Um, so um, it's without too much elaboration, uh, please answer. Will you pledge not to take contributions from the fossil fuel industry? And this is a yes or no question, so Joe? We get to add a sentence of explanation, is that correct? You That's can add correct. one sentence, yes. Okay, uh, the short answer is I do pledge not to take contributions. And the reason is that oil companies will not contribute to candidates. It's suicide for the candidates. The spouses or the executives might contribute to candidates or the oil companies will give money to the state party, which will give the money to the candidates. 
but you will not find any candidate in the state who has gotten money from an oil company. Thank you, Sean. Yes. Liz. Yeah, I will not take money from fossil fuel corporations. Um, I will, but not just them, because I also want to focus on my values. And I seriously doubt that Elon Musk is going to write me a billion dollar check. But if he were, I would send it right back. Because we can't just talk about cleaning our environment and saving our world if we're not taking care of what people need tomorrow. Thank you. Jennifer. Yes, I will not be taking fossil fuel money or any corporate money for that matter. Thank you. So that is the end of our uh, predetermined questions that we had sent to the candidates. And now I think we have some time to ask questions that came through from the uh, attendees today. So Martha, uh, can we have a question for the candidates? Yeah. I would love to do that. Actually, a lot of people have been asking very similar questions. So, and I'm going to be able this time to pull up a question that they have already prepared for, which seems like a good deal. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and read the question on sea level rise. Um, because the really cool thing about 8020 is that um, it goes through a huge amount of varied terrain. And all along the edge of 8020, along the bay, is uh, sea level rise communities. And they're not just in 8020, but uh, all around in the entire area and at the coast of California. So sea level rise impacts on bay area communities include some of our most vulnerable socioeconomic populations, including single parents, communities of color, and they were all hardest hit during the pandemic. What will you do as a legislator to respond to the impacts of sea level rise on bay and coastal communities equitably? Thank you, Martha. Uh, for this question, we'll start with Sean, and then Liz, Jennifer, and then Joe. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we absolutely must look at everything we do through an equity lens, and we need to put forward unprecedented investments to address this issue. Um, I am very excited to see work such as um, what we've seen done with the Hayward Regional Shoreline Master Plan. And that was recently approved and they're now doing testing in a pilot phase to learn about some mitigation efforts that might work. You know, some of the biggest threats in this area are from sea level rise and coastal flooding and along with uh, rising groundwater levels. And we could potentially see some saltwater intrusion uh, into our groundwater. And these impacts are gonna really hit our built infrastructure. You know, we're talking about key transportation corridors, we're talking about business parks, warehouses, wastewater treatment plants, uh, utility infrastructure. And yes, it's gonna impact some of our residential areas. Uh, so, and, and not to mention you know, other ecological impacts to our local flora, fauna and migratory birds. So I would ensure that we invest in these types of projects that are locally led, such as the Hayward Regional Shoreline Master Plan, and make sure that we're getting funding down so that they can apply those into the communities where they see fit. And apart from protecting these assets, we really have to um, make sure that we keep open our recreational areas. As we saw in the pandemic, uh, these were uh, key refuges for people to get out and to exercise and uh, particularly our disadvantages, commun disadvantaged communities need access to those types of uh, spaces. Thank you, Sean. Liz? Yeah, sea level rise is a, it's a big problem um, that we're all going to have to deal with at some point. I know that I live in San Leandro and we'll be underwater in the coming decades if we don't do something dramatic to reverse the rising global temperatures and sea levels. And this includes significant parts of um, dealing with our regional partners like the Oakland International Airport um, because you know, we have uh, this problem and we need partners. We need to be able to work with one another. We need to be able to negotiate to make sure that we implement things like budgets that allocate money towards the appropriate planning locally and regionally to address the rising sea levels. 
but we can't just talk about it. We also have to hold ourselves accountable. Again, we talk a lot about protecting our communities or color. Many of them are near um, you know, places where we're gonna see this impact first. So we need to make sure that we develop the sea level rise uh, program to make sure that there's loans for people who live near the rising levels and have homes so that we can prepare as well as properties and transportation. Thank you, Liz. Jennifer. Thank you. You know, last fall, SB1, written by Senator Atkins, was written into law and signed by the governor. And it takes sea level rise into account for planning. But I have a couple plans here next to my desk. One was written in 2010, one was written in 2015. Plans take a very long time to develop, they take a very long time to implement, and they are just as much time in between revisions. So while we are planning, I want to make sure that we are also implementing, that we coordinate amongst our regulatory bodies for benchmarks, goals, and enforcement today of new standards that do not take five to 10 years before we actually see some implementation. The Hayward Shoreline Plan is an excellent example of a community taking action and paying close attention to what is necessary. And 8020 has one third of its residents residing in an unincorporated area, San Lorenzo being one of them that also touches the bay. And unincorporated areas do not have the ability to plan in the same ways that our cities do. So we have to have statewide regulations that protect the entire coastal region. Our transportation corridors are absolutely at risk, including BART, including 880. As I stated earlier, we are in the midst of a crisis and we have to act in a way that implements plans that are at the scale and in the timeline at which this crisis is upon us. The California Green New Deal, also known as the California Climate Jobs Plan, gives us the opportunity to put millions of people to work, developing infrastructure, and employing our community members with good union jobs immediately so that we can start to do this. We cannot nibble around the edges. We have to do more and we have to do it urgently. And working together with community partners is the way. Thank you. Joe. Well, I, again, I'm kind of flummoxed by this discussion because here we are meeting all of our climate goals set by the governors and by the legislature, and yet we're still being told that we have to prepare for utter disaster. So why did we go through the whole trouble of having climate goals and reducing our carbon emissions if there's going to be a disaster anyway? Okay, so let me tell you, the legislature, our assembly person is only supposed to look out for us. I'm not supposed to look out for the rest of the Bay Area. And I'll tell you who I'm worried about. A hundred years ago, the city of San Francisco dumped landfill on its tidal flats and thought they would build a big city. It's the city that you see when you go across the bridge. Unfortunately, it's built on mud and the mud flows away. So 100 years ago, the city of San Francisco also built something called a seawall, the Embarcadero seawall, to keep the mud in and prevent San Francisco from washing away. This has nothing to do with climate change. It has everything to do with stupid decisions that were made when the city of San Francisco was founded. And now what San Francisco is gonna do is use the climate emergency to get money from everybody else, including poor old District 20 in Hayward to rebuild their seawall. And that's gonna cost billions and billions of dollars. So we're gonna be sitting here paying for San Francisco's mistakes. And I will not allow that if I'm elected to the legislature. Thanks. Thank you. I see a lot of really good questions coming in. So Martha, can we pick another question, please? Sorry, it's 8.05, so we're going to keep time for closing statements, but I'm, we can ask one more question. Um, and um, there, would it be okay to ask them, um, you guys, sorry, 
Sorry, I just set a timer on myself. Um, hold on a second. Um, is it okay to ask you um, about your background going into this? It was one of the questions we were going to ask you. Um, what about your life and your background and your history has really prepared you for this position? Thank you. Uh, let's start with Liz, then Jennifer, Joe, and Sean. So I'll go back to my opening statement. What makes me ready for this position is the fact that I've been working for our communities for over tw two decades, uh, for 20 years. I've been at the forefront of fighting for teachers, fighting for nurses, fighting for firefighters, and fighting for our climate. I don't see climate justice different from making sure that we have good union jobs. They're the same things. And I've delivered. I've worked with the Sierra Club recently in my current role as the head of the Alameda Labor Council, where we took on Amazon. And I agree with Jennifer, we don't have time to plan. Sometimes we just need to get into action. And in this case, we did. We were able to get together as the building trades, as the Sierra Club, as community leaders to stop our corporation from further polluting our communities. And that's what I will continue to do. These are not just talking points for me. This is things that I've worked on, that I've been in, that I've seen, especially working in Sacramento for five years as AFNI uh, political director. I was there in the middle of the night where they weren't thinking about Mireya or people who look like us. I was there when they were changing words in the middle of the night when they were negotiating budgets to, you know, when it comes to climate change. It would be as simple as one word, shall or may. I will make sure that the shall is there. Thank you, Liz. Jennifer? Yeah, you know, I'm a registered nurse and everything that I do is intersectional. Um, as a black woman, as a parent, as a resident of the unincorporated community, um, as a caretaker to people who are precariously housed or unhoused, uh, I recognize that the work that I've been doing and the work of the Sierra Club are same. We're trying to reach the same goals and the pandemic has laid bare so many disparities that have existed for far too long. In order for us to address our climate change, we do have to tackle health, equity, and justice because health is foundational. When someone is having an asthma attack and they simply cannot breathe, it doesn't happen independent of the world we live in. Um, I was saying in an earlier question, and forgive me for being long-winded, but 8020 is on a transportation corridor. We have four freeways running through our communities, 580, 880, 680, and 238. We have the Oakland airport just a couple miles away, and we constantly have the exposure to jet fuel overhead and diesel fuel all around. And Harvard scientists conducted a study that really just codifies exactly what's been happening in our community. When you have prolonged exposure to air pollution, you are at risk. 15 times more likely to die from COVID, but also at risk for other health outcomes. And we are seeing that in our community every single day. Healthcare justice and environmental justice are linked. They are overlapping and intersectional. And if we can clean our air, if we can clean our environment, if we can put people to work, keep folks housed, keep them living in areas where this transportation corridor can get clean, with mass transit that is also clean, then we can solve for some of these problems. 50% of all air pollution is derived through transportation. We can solve this, we can do it quickly, and all we need to do is be creative and willing. Thank you. Joe? Uh, once again, this is a problem that we have solved. So I don't know why we're going on solving it again. So the, the question is, what in my background prepares me to address these issues? As a scientist, what you're trained to do is to question assumptions and then to build <laughs> creative new solutions from basic facts and principles rather than by doing what you've always done. And even though the legislature and the governor have largely met our climate goals or put in place programs that will meet our goals in about 10 years. We're being told that we have to keep on doing 
more programs and spend more money to solve the same problem again. And I'm saying, stop, don't solve the same problem. Go on and do something useful, such as improving education in the district, such as improving the quality of life uh, by building new parks or by helping our schools. So um, it's my scientific background that will allow me to see through all this uh, confusing statistics that we've been hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about my backstory. So when my parents got divorced when I was 11 years old, my mom loaded us up in a U-Haul and we left the Bay Area and we went to West Phoenix where my mom grew up. And uh, my late grandfather, who's an army veteran and he had retired from Arizona state government at the time, he'd come over every morning to cook us breakfast and pack our lunch and drop us off at school. You know, it was through my grandparents' help that my mom was able to go back to school. and She started her own career, all while being a single mom to my brother and I. With a little help from, my, uh, from some government-backed student loans, with food stamps and welfare payments, and with a whole lot of grit. My late mother, she got an education. She started a career as a registered nurse. She went on to join the Army Nurse Corps, and she retired as a VA psych nurse. So what my family story instills in me is the value of service, service to serve country, community, family, and to those people that sometimes need an extra boost. My experience has taught me the value of good governance, that government can and should be there to protect our most vulnerable and be a safety net for when people fall on tough times. And that's why when my mother passed away in 2015, I decided I was taking going to take custody of my, my younger brother. And he was uh, in middle school at the time. And uh, he, um, um, you know, came to live with us and, and went on to go to school and recently graduated and decided to go on and, and uh, join the army. And, you know, it's this kind of instilling service from generation to generation that I'm all about. And that's why I've served as a city council member. That's why I've served in the Navy for 20 years. And that's why I'd love to serve as your next assembly member. When you serve, you put everyone else above yourself and when you're making those decisions. And my life informs that work. And uh, I hope to do that uh, for you, the people of Assembly District 20. Thank you. Um, I hope that last question was not your closing statement because we do have two minutes for each of you <laughs> now to make your closing statements. Um, we'll start with Liz and then move to Jennifer, Joe, and then, I'm sorry, uh, I've got the wrong order. We start with Jennifer, move to Joe, Sean, and then Liz. Jennifer. Thank you so much. We need investment that is bigger than anything we've ever spent. We need solutions that are transformative and expansive. There can be no nibbling around the edges if we want to impact the climate because there's been no nibbling around the edges from fossil fuel companies for all these years. I'm running a corporate free campaign because money from corporations is ruinous. We have to keep it out of our elections and we have to keep it out of our decision-making. Environmental justice is healthcare justice. I'm a registered nurse. I care for our communities and I will make every decision as I lead based in health, in equity, and in justice. We all breathe the same air, we drink the same water, and we all will be impacted by everything in our environment and our community. I am ready to implement plans that are at the solution of the scale of our crisis, that are rapid, and that are cost-effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Joe? Um, let's see. So I wanna again emphasize that my background as a scientist helps me uh, propose creative solutions to problems. And um, one solution that I'm proposing that would improve the quality of life here is to turn the collection of government owned property on the shoreline of the East Bay into a state park. And the reason that's important to be a state park is because the state has the experts on how to balance wildlife preservation and to provide quality recreational areas. And uh, the state also has the money and the muscle to put the whole thing together. So I'd like to see the Bay Area shoreline become a state park. 
Secondly, and now I'm going to go to the blue line behind my head. We have a traffic problem on our freeways. The freeways are what's congested. And in order to fix that congestion, it's a simple matter to get rid of the cars that are not that are simply passing through our area rather than using our area as a destination. So I propose hiring the boring company to build the tunnel, which is the blue line behind me here, that will connect West Dublin with the San Mateo Bridge. <laughs> All the traffic that is now clogging Highway 580 and Interstate 238 instead can go through that tunnel. They will all be electric cars by 2030, be, thanks to our governor and our legislature. And so it can be an inexpensive, cheap, uh, efficient, safe tunnel to get all that traffic off of our freeways. And that will greatly improve the quality of life in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thank you. I'm Sean Kumagai, city council member, lifelong Democrat, veteran, and I'm the first openly LGBTQ elected official in the Tri-Valley region. My decades of experience in the military as a, as a local activist, as a elected city council member, and as a district director for an assembly member makes me ready loaded to serve on day one. I'm the only elected official running in this race, and I'm the only Asian American running in a plurality AAPI district. The people of Assembly District 20 need an assembly member who will work to build coalition and consensus so that they can accomplish meaningful reforms in Sacramento and bring back results for the people of the East Bay. And I believe I am that person. And I'm excited to get to work for you in Sacramento. In just three weeks, I've earned the endorsement and support of local and elected leaders who are longtime um, activists in, this, uh, in these organizations that are presenting this forum tonight such as Assembly Member Rebecca Bauer Cahan, State Treasurer Fiona Ma, Dublin Mayor Melissa Hernandez and Council Members Mike McCorson and Jean Josie, Union City Mayor Carol Dutra Vernacci, Pleasanton Mayor Carla Brown, San Leandro Council Member Victor Aguilar Jr., San Leandro Unified Trustee retired Louis Haystack, Hayward Council Members retired Kevin Dowling and Al Mendel, Dublin Unified School District Trustee Megan Roust and Livermore Joint Unified School District Trustee Christy Wong and many other local elected officials past and present from across the district. And we have secured the early endorsement of the Asian American Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, the Housing Action Coalition and the Northern California Carpenters. I hope to be your partner to advance a smart agenda to tackle climate change, education, criminal justice reform and the affordability crisis. Please follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for updates. And please visit seankumagai.com to learn more and join the team. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Liz? Oh, I thought I was last. No? You're, you're it now. Oh, OK. Uh, buenas noches. Muchas gracias otra vez por estar aquí con nosotros. My name is Liz Ortega. And I'm ready to deliver as your next assembly district representative for District 20. Like I've said earlier, I've dedicated all of my life to, to work tirelessly to improve the lives of everyone in my community. And I've delivered. I will fight to protect our coastlines and wildlife, support clean energy investments, and push for stricter environmental regulations to hold ourselves accountable to people like Mireya, because we need more of her and less of the people who think there's nothing wrong in this world and that everything is fine. We need to make sure that the communities that we live in, the ones that I represent currently, are say, have a home, have a job that pays a decent wage so that they don't have to travel miles and miles to get to their jobs. I wanna make sure that I get in there and I deliver for us on day one, just like I have here in this community my entire life. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the end of today's forum. I wanna thank all the community members for being engaged and for your questions and thank each of the candidates for your candid responses today. So I wanna close with a couple of quotes by Margaret Mead. Never doubt 
that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And the second quote by her, we won't have a society if we destroy the environment. Keeping these two statements in mind, I urge you all to stay engaged between now and next year's elections, but more importantly, beyond and between elections. Look at today's event as the first step in continued conversations. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today. I want to thank Jennifer Esteen, Joe Gercher, Sean Kumagai, Liz Ortega Toro for your commitment to public service and for your thoughtful conversation today. Putting an event like this to together takes a community. Thank you to each of our co-hosts for tonight. San Francisco uh, chapter of the Sierra Club, San Francisco Bay chapter of the Sierra Club, Livermore Indivisible, 350 East Bay, Castro Valley Citizens Climate Lobby, the Peace and Justice Action Team of the Star Unitarian Universalist Church. And finally, before I turn this over to her, a special shout out to Martha Krieger, who put in tons of time and energy into this um, and representing the Sierra Club, San Francisco Bay Chapter as its vice chair and for spearheading this event with her team. Um, thank you all and over to you, Martha. I just wanted to say to everyone, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, I also wanted to thank Virginia Reinhardt, who is our chapter director. She's here. I wanted to really reach out to Oscar and his partner for doing our Spanish translation. We're going to try and do that more as we move on because our community is very diverse. We're in one of the best places in the world. Sorry, I'm kind of biased. And I would really, really, really like to lead with that piece. I really also want to join Anu in thanking all of the candidates for coming out. And I really want to encourage you not to think of this as a getting elected place, even though I know you are and that's all you're thinking about. But every relationship, every, every conversation you have with us is building that team to move forward and solve our issues because you're it for us. You're going to really do a lot to fix this and we need you badly. I also want to thank Kyoko Takayama. I want to thank Kathy Durbin, Jack Lucero, um, Jennifer. I want to really put a shout out to everyone who's helped and all the community members, especially Helena Strader, who found everybody to come out and speak and give these questions. Thank you so much for coming. I also want to say I didn't ask the solar question and I really needed to, but I thought we needed a bit longer time. If it is possible, could you please have those conversations with other people and tell us how we can fix that problem? Because I have solar on my roof and I would like everybody to have it. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, folks. I knew you're muted. Oh, I, I just wanted to say. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. We love Buenas you. Buenas noches. Thank you, Buenas Liz. noches. Thank you so much. This is great. I knew you were amazing. Yeah. Thank you. That's always.